So let's talk about the cloud networking a little bit. So if you look at the on-prem data centers, uh, the way they, they build actually, they fall in a proper architecture, like I said before. So on the left-hand side, you see this Cisco data center architecture uh, that has the DC access layer, the aggregation layer and the core layer, right? And then this is access is where your applications are connecting in basic. So, and then you have aggregation where you have uh, maybe the firewall or things of that nature. And the DC core is the highly high, high performant core uh, that is responsible for routing for all those, um, uh, those systems there, or maybe connecting to the outside world, right? So, so, that, so, so, so the idea is that this is how you have been deploying the on-prem data centers. And then the evolution happened, the leaf and spine architecture came into existence and then different uh, vendors, they gave their own definition of uh, how to define and design the data centers, right? Uh, but like I said, this on-prem world was slow. Uh, I still remember that back then when I was in Cisco, uh, customers used to call us and they said, you know, we need to provide uh, these services faster to our application owners because even checking out the VLAN sometimes takes uh, two or three weeks. So that was the, the case back then, right? Uh, and that actually started the movement. And then these DevOps guys said, you know what, this is very slow for us. So we cannot wait for uh, a server to be given to us in, uh, in two, three weeks. We want our applications to be deployed, you know, really fast. So that started all the movement, right? So, so yeah, so this is, this is where the VMware, uh, it came into picture and they said, okay, we can virtualize those, uh, those servers. You can now run the applications on a, on a virtual machine, but notice that it's still, it's all on-prem. This is managed by um, some IT team and uh, on the on-prem. So yeah, it was a bit faster than, than before, but it's still, it was not uh, good enough even, right? So people started building, uh, and, and then this is where the architecture gap come in, uh, comes in, right? Because now uh, you are putting the application in there and uh, no one is giving you any direction. So, so how should you do that? So that's why you need some new architecture, which is the MCNA. And this is exactly what um, Aviatix is providing to the industry. Okay, so if you look at the definition of um, different cloud computing models, there is, a, there is a model which you see on the left-hand side, which is completely on-prem model. This is where you, know, you scale and you manage it and you, you grow it. So this is all your responsibility as an IT team, right? So everything in this. But then there is an infrastructure as a service option, which is provided by the, uh, the cloud providers. So the cloud providers, what they do, they, they will manage the, the hardware the, the software, the storage, networking and whatnot. And now you're responsible for running the virtual machine. Um, you're patching the OS and then, you know, everything, right? So this is one way of, of uh, utilizing the, the cloud in the infrastructure as a service way. Then these cloud providers, providers also provide you pass, like, um, like DynamoDB is an example of pass where now you can um, they're not only managing the hardware pieces or the compute and storage pieces, but also some middleware and the runtime OS, right? So now you're only consuming it from the, uh, as a platform. And the last piece is software as a service. So this is where um, they're managing everything. So you're just consuming the service. For example, right now we are consuming uh, Zoom. This meeting is uh, on Zoom. So everything is managed by, by the Zoom guys. They have their own data center and everything. We are just consuming the software. So this is the example of software as a service. So this is, these are the big three themes you see in the public cloud space. This is how people are uh, designing the applications or people are using the cloud for various, in the various uh, different ways. Okay, so you will find this in in there if you go in there you will see there is a there is something called hybrid cloud so basically this hybrid cloud term was coined by the the csps um, and they basically define uh, that okay so if you have the on-prem and if you want to connect to the cloud uh, that will make it a hybrid cloud 
And the reason is that they don't want to say multi-cloud because for them, their cloud is the only cloud. It's the perfect cloud. You don't need any other cloud, right? AWS will never tell you to go and use Azure for something else. So that's the reason they created this term called a hybrid cloud, which is about uh, connecting your public cloud to the private cloud or your on-prem data center. Okay, so just wanna get this thing out there. Okay, let's talk about the public cloud basics. So the public cloud is, um, is obviously uh, providing a lot of services, right? It's, it's resilient, it's available, highly available. It's in multiple regions and whatnot. But at the end of the day, it's just another hardware. It's just piece of uh, hardware running somewhere, right? So it has its own issues, its own problem. It's not like magic where you say, okay, yeah, I'm going into the cloud and then life is good. No, they do go, do, uh, go down. I have a customer in New York, uh, a large uh, multi, uh, multimedia company. And AWS TGW went down in uh, November last year for about six or seven hours. And um, yeah, I mean, that's not good, right? Because um, the business depends on it, but they didn't have any visibility into it. And, um, and now they are using Aviatrix, which is providing the visibility, but that's a different story. But the point I'm trying to make here is that, you know, it's not magic, you know, these things, they do go down. So the way they define it is, is like this. And this is what you see across the board. So they have their own data centers, their own hardware pieces there sitting somewhere. And then they put it in some regions. So they have divided this whole earth or globe in different regions. So in US, for example, they have US West. Then you will see US Central, US East. And then same thing is in Europe. And then same thing is in Asia Pac, right? So these data centers are grouped in certain, certain regions. And within the region, you have a concept of availability loan. So let's say if we are in Silicon Valley in, uh, in California region, they might have a data center in San Jose and the second one in San Francisco or somewhere else. So that will be an example of availability zone within a region. Okay. So this is how this, uh, uh, the region looks like, right? So this is the picture I took from the Azure website. And these numbers you see on the bottom, they keep changing because they keep adding different regions, different resources, and they're always growing based on their, uh, based on the customer demand. But yeah, they have uh, their own set of network running behind the scene. And as an enterprise, uh, if you look at this picture, I mean, there is no way for any enterprise to have this massive uh, infrastructure or set of data centers placed across the globe, right? So that's why the cloud becomes, you know, uh, the point or, or the place where all the enterprises, they want to go. They want to get out of this managing the, the, the fiber cable and then the data center business. Same is true for AWS. So AWS has a set of regions uh, across the globe. And uh, same story goes for GCP. I don't have any slide, but I think you get the idea. So let's double, double click on AZ, availability zone, because this concept becomes important. Uh, but at the same time, it is different for different clouds. So that's another theme you will see that uh, all these clouds, they look similar from outside, but they are actually different. The way they implement uh, various services or their networking or their data center is actually different. And that's another challenge that a lot of my customers, they face. Um, so yeah, so this is the example of AZ. So we have AZA, AZB within the same region, and they try to make sure that uh, these are highly available. They are at a distance where they can actually replicate this, uh, this database layer or data layer so that if this zone goes down within the region, the second one is there to pick up, right? So that's how they provide the high availability. Okay, so yeah, so the public cloud network, they look similar but at the end, they're different. So the, why they look similar? They look similar because what they're trying to do, they're trying to provide you the same set of services that you were getting in the on-prem data center. So they gave you this concept of VPC, virtual private cloud, or Azure calls it VNet, virtual network, or Oracle call it uh, VCN, right? But the idea is same. This is your data center, private data center. 
Now within the data center, the most important thing is the application, this virtual machine, right? And they have different names for it. So AWS calls it EC2, or sometimes you will see AMI, Amazon Machine Instance. Uh, Azure will call it virtual machine. GCP will call it virtual machine, but this is a virtual machine, Linux or Windows running your application. And um, these virtual machines are sitting on different subnets. So they need uh, some routing entity. So this is the router you see, but this router is hidden. You don't see it, they'll, they'll tell you that if you are creating the subnets, we'll route it for you within the VPC, don't worry about it, right? And when it comes to the uh, security, they give you some security uh, constructs. For example, the ACL or security groups, right? But they are actually very primitive if you ask me. In some cases, it solves the problem for um, uh, some small or medium business customers, but uh, it's not, like um, it will solve all your security problems, right? So yeah, so this is what they will give you. Um, and uh, yeah, so this is your application running in the VNet, but obviously, you know, this is not enough. You need to have connectivity to uh, towards internet. So you're receiving the traffic from internet. You're sending the traffic towards internet in some, some cases. You have your users coming into this VNet and uh, trying to get access to these virtual machines or applications. Uh, these data centers will stay there right? Because um, eventually there will be a time and everything will be in the cloud. But for five, six or seven years, you will see you will need some sort of a private link to connect to your data center. Right? So, so yeah, so they look very similar, but they are different. And then they have their own limitations. Okay, so because the constructs are not enterprise grade. And I don't blame these guys for not providing all that because you have to think uh, from, from their perspective is that they need to support these um, you know, large number of customers, like hundreds and thousands of customers. Okay, so it's, it's impossible for them to provide the enterprise, enterprise grade constructs or services there. And they have their own limitations. For example, this um, limitation I'm showing here is the 100 BGP route limit in AWS. Okay, so this is, uh, you can only have 100 BGP routes per route table in, um, in AWS DGW. So that's, that's not good, that's not enterprise grade. There are no routing control. There are no advanced knobs in BGP, like uh, the communities or AS path depend on and, and things of that nature, right? Service insertion has its own challenges. It's not, it's not easy. Even if you do service insertion, you are uh, limited by 1.25 GB throughput um, due to IPsec tunnel that they, that they ask you to build. Visibility is another issue, like I mentioned before. This router, for example, here, you don't get to see the route table or you cannot actually troubleshoot it if, if it is not working in the, behind the scene. 